All right. Um, so jumping in, um, this uh, talk was inspired um, by basically me looking around for something to talk about at the beginning um, of the call for papers for this talk. And that was around about the time that um, uh, R was celebrating its 20th anniversary. Bursary. It was actually released uh, on February the 29th, 2000, uh, which is a real date. Uh, and there was a conference held in Copenhagen to celebrate that. But the R community has grown so much um, in recent years that I kind of thought it would be interesting to have a look at um, the history of R, especially with those people that were new to the community, because there's lots of really interesting things that happened in there. Now, I don't have any real authority <laughs> to talk about the history of R. Uh, I'm not a member of the R core group. Uh, my name is on the introduction to R manual, but that's actually because of some work I did with S, uh, which is the predecessor language uh, to R. Um, and in fact, that's where our story starts, um, because I think uh, we need to go back to S, which is really the first uh, interactive um, data analysis language that was ever invented. Uh, it was invented by John Chambers and colleagues at Bell Labs, and this is actually a picture of John Chambers' whiteboard um, from 1976, uh, where he sketched out the first design principles behind S, uh, which were fundamentally behind creating an interface language, which would allow people who were doing data analysis uh, to be able to access all the computational uh, resources that currently existed mainly in Fortran libraries. So this idea about having a language that was extensible, being able to connect to um, really powerful statistical computation libraries. That was the basic design behind S. But in 1992, um, S, S was really only available as commercial software, uh, something called S plus, um, and in particular was not available for Macintoshes. And these two gentlemen that you see in this photo here, um, this is uh, Robert Gentleman there on the left, Rosa Harker there on the right. Um, at the time, they were both at the University of Auckland. And they decided to collaborate in putting together a new language modeled on those design principles of S and indeed many of the nature, many of the aspects of the language itself, which they could then use as a teaching and a research platform uh, for themselves. And they did make it available to the public. And in very typical way, um, it was a very low key announcement, which was made as a reply in the S News mailing list, which was kind of the big discussion forum back then uh, for statistical computing. Um, somebody was asking like, is there S available for Max? And Rossa Harker, who was one of those two founders of R, responded that he and Robert Gentleman were looking at the problem, had designed uh, an initial implementation and were making it available um, as a language called R uh, for Max. And if you actually dive in and have a look at um, sort of the details of that Max, I'll just read this to you. They say, warning, this is very preliminary. Prerequisites, a Macintosh computer, floating point is preferable. I didn't even know floating point was not an option back then. Um, and how you could do statistical computing without floating points is quite beyond me. Um, but also you need at least 2.5 megs of memory, which is probably about as much as this watch I have in my wrist has right now. So just a bit of context uh, for back there in 1993. Now, R really started taking off in, in 1995. And the big sort of breaking point was in R was released um, as free software under the GNU General Public License. Um, this is uh, recounted in a nice paper, which you can find on Russell Harker's website. Uh, the link, um, like all the links for this talk, are in the GitHub repository. You can see down there on the lower left-hand the left side of the screen. Um, and um, in that here, Ross talks about how Martin Meckler convinced uh, he and Robert to release R as open source software. And it also goes into some of the interesting design goals um, of the R language itself. So if you're interested in some of those technical details, um, have a look at that paper. Uh, this was also the time when the first mailing list uh, for R was created and a lot of uh, academics and researchers joined into that mailing list and then interest in R started growing quite rapidly uh, by word of mouth. Now at that time, up until that time rather, the only way you could access R was by downloading it via FTP uh, from a particular website called StatLib. Uh, but in 1997, uh, CRAN was founded. Now CRAN is the website uh, where you download R. Um, CRAN in fact predates uh, the Wayback Machine. So I went back as far as I could to the Wayback Machine to find the earliest instance of the CRAN website and you can see it right there. Uh, just for comparison, this is how CRAN looks today. Did you catch that? It's like, this is the old one, this is the new one. Okay, it's not very different. Um, but CRAN 
is more than just a website. Uh, CRAN is also the repository uh, for all the packages that people contribute to Extender. And in fact, CRAN really was the genesis of an entire ecosystem. And I think this is the real thing that makes our uh, difference and makes it really unique is the easy way that people have to extend R through additional packages. We've seen so many examples of that here today. Um, and the ability to distribute them and to act, get access, access to them uh, really easily uh, through the CRAN system. Now at this point, R was still uh, sort of a beta version. It wasn't sort of a fully 1.0, uh, but the official release uh, of the very first production version of R, 1.R, uh, R.1.00 um, was released on February the 29th, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Um, as I was preparing this talk, I thought it'd be interesting to go back and check this out. Um, you can still download R100 uh, from CRAN. Uh, so I downloaded it to my Windows 10 machine, installed it, unpacked the zip file, and it ran right out of the box. And that's pretty incredible. And uh, when you think about it, you know, in the 20 years that have passed, Computers have gone from 16 bits to 32 bits to 64 bits, different chipsets, different APIs, all sorts of things. Um, really, really incredible that it, you can still use it just as you can today. I was able to run the demo function, have a look at uh, and it works much the same way as it does today. Um, I couldn't access packages because you need some, some other um, uh, software like links and wget to be able to access to the internet because that wasn't really a thing back then, uh, but it works just great, uh, which is uh, really interesting to see. You'll also notice that the interface isn't particularly different uh, than the interface you might be using on Windows or the command line today, uh, but we'll have more to say about that in a minute as well. Probably the next big event uh, in the history of R came in April 2000, uh, which was when the R Foundation uh, was incorporated. Formerly, it's the R Foundation for Statistical Computing. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, based in Vienna, Austria. Uh, where a couple of the R core members were based at that time, and indeed still are. Uh, the presidents when it was founded, and again, the earliest version of the website I could find was in 2002, and the presidents then were the creators of R, Robert Gentleman and Rossa Harker. Uh, probably the, the major role of the R Foundation is that is the legal entity um, that controls R in the sense of um, holding the copyright uh, to R and all of its documentation. Uh, but you can, it does accept membership. Um, you can actually uh, donate to the R Foundation online these days, which is awesome. And I recommend you do so uh, if you're getting benefit out of R as free software. Uh, and that funds things like the servers that run CRAN. Uh, it also funds the R Journal, uh, which is an academic journal, which has been published for about 13 years now, I think, uh, with research and, uh, and uh, new papers uh, related to R. And of course, there's also the annual Use R conference, uh, which the R, R Foundation puts on as well. That comes from all of those funds. I remember um, back in 2009, uh, it was the morning of my birthday, in fact, uh, I went out to my front door and picked up uh, the copy of the New York Times, which was still, I was still getting in print edition at that time, uh, and opened up the front page. Uh, well, technically, it was the front page of the technology section, but it sort of fell out right in front of me. Um, and there, right on the front page, was this uh, full-page story uh, about R. Um, Ashley Vance, uh, he's a very, very well-known journalist um, at the Times. He did things like Elon Musk biography since then. Interviewed Ross and Robert and several other people, and just painted this really, really great story uh, about R and how it was used. If you haven't read that story, I do recommend you follow the link uh, at the GitHub repository and check that out. It's, it's really, really interesting. But for me, and at that time, I was working with a company that was commercializing R called Revolution Analytics. This was really the time when R hit the mainstream. You know, suddenly uh, leaders at companies heard about R that was already being used a lot of the time within their companies, um, but it um, was within sort of departments and because it was free software that people just downloaded by themselves, the IT department never heard about it. It was kind of being done in secret, but this was really where R came out and people realized just how many people were using it for, for very advanced and very important data analysis at all kinds of companies. Speaking of companies, um, our studio uh, was, uh, had just gotten going at that point. Uh, but then in February 2011, um, they announced uh, the first public availability of the first version of our studio. 
Um, you've seen our studio in many of the talks here already today. Um, it really broke ground in terms of making much, uh, much more accessible and usable, especially for people that were developing with R, you know, doing, working with lots of code, particularly making packages, and really started to accelerate that ecosystem of people contributing to the R ecosystem uh, through uh, the packages that they made. And of course, our studio also created a, a really good collection of useful open source packages, the Tidyverse, of course, uh, being the um, sort of the classic example there, and uh, really, really contributed to the acceleration and adoption of R because those packages really, really made it much more easy for people to get in and start analyzing data uh, directly. Um, incidentally, if you didn't hear the news, um, just a couple of months ago, our studio, the company, reincorporated itself as a B Corporation. Uh, that's a special class of companies in the United States, which is specifically dedicated to the public good. Public good. Um, and that was sort of really great news there as well. Uh, again, I went back to the Wayback Machine to have a look um, at how our studio was announced. Um, the only sort of official sort of announcement on a mailing list or anything I can find was this very low key announcement on the R help uh, mailing list. But that, uh, there is a blog post that went to the R studio website on that same day. Uh, which you can find uh, in, the, in the show notes for this as well. I think another sort of big moment in the ecosystem around R uh, was when uh, Microsoft acquired Revolution Analytics. Uh, that's actually how I ended up at Microsoft. Uh, I was at Revolution Analytics at that time, and I've been at Microsoft ever since that happened. And that sparked lots of things happening both within Microsoft and for Microsoft customers who are using R. Um, on the product side, it meant that R was now incorporated into lots of uh, Microsoft products, you know, things that people in your company probably use day in, day out, you know, things like SQL Server and Power BI. It's also been integrated into Azure and the Azure Machine Learning Service. Um, but I think beyond those integrations, I think what was most significant about this event was that it made R legit in some sense within companies. Like I said, I was working for a company that was selling R to companies at that point, and the kind of responses we were getting were along the lines of, you know, we love R, our data analysis are using R, that's really awesome, but it's free software. Like, who supports it? Um, is it going to be around? Who's going to provide all the backup around that? And when Microsoft acquired Revolution Analytics and started supporting R, that all went away. Uh, the, there's a response of, well, if Microsoft supports it, then you can use R was just a, a really a no brainer for lots of companies there. And beyond the technical integrations with the products, uh, one of the first things that Microsoft did after the acquisition of Revolution Analytics was to be one of the founder members of the R Consortium, one of the founding platinum members of the R Consortium, along with R Studio and Genentech and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation are also uh, platinum members of the R Consortium today. What that means is those platinum members contribute um, $100,000 a year, um, along with uh, money from all the other members as well, which provides a pool of funds, which then get dispersed back out to the community by the R Consortium. And that has really served to uh, provide financial support and support the growth of the R community as a whole. Uh, this includes things like funding individual R user groups, uh, funding collections uh, of R user groups, like R, the, the R Ladies Network, uh, funding technical projects like R Hub, uh, which is a site that supports package developers um, to build, package, build and test packages on all sorts of platforms, uh, supporting events, uh, things like supporting the video streaming and recording uh, for the user conferences over the last three or four years. Uh, and in general, anybody can make a proposal to the R Consortium for funding of a project or an event or a working group that they feel would be beneficial to the R community as, as a whole. Um, the, the, um, uh, the committee at the R Consortium reviews those uh, submissions and then can provide funds accordingly. But going on, I mean, the R community is going from strengths to strengths. Strength. Uh, one way we can look at that is to have a look at CRAN uh, package growth uh, over the last 22 years, in fact. This is from a blog post that came out uh, last month by Joseph Hanyala. I hope I pronounced that cor correctly. Um, there are currently more than 15,000 packages available on CRAN. And you can see in blue there the number of new packages uh, that have been either been released or updated um, every year. And the black is the brand new packages that have been contributed over that time as well. So you can see the ecosystem is continuing to grow um, and providing new capabilities as well. 
And then I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uh, back in February was the 20th anniversary of R1.0.0. Um, check out the celebration website. It's linked to from this slide where you can watch all the talks from that event. Really interesting ones. Uh, one I do recommend you check out is Peter Dalgard, uh, who was a member of the R core group, who at that event uh, released uh, the latest version of R 3.6.3 live uh, on camera as part of that event. So go check that out. And R is still being updated and, um, and, uh, and released regularly. And in fact, there's a major update for R coming just next month on April the 24th with R 4.0.0. And today, you know, R still is at the forefront of science and data analysis. Uh, we see lots of examples today here in this conference, uh, R being used to manage the electrical grid, R being used in teaching, R being used to create official government reports, and even R being used to tackle the COVID pandemic. Um, as part of my work, I've actually been on several calls and, and meetings just in the last week about R being used at research institutions and government agencies uh, to tackle the response to COVID. But just to capture that, I just wanted to show you this, this one slide. Um, you've probably seen this chart come across Twitter. Uh, it's from John Burns Murdoch um, at the Financial Times, created this amazing visualization uh, of the spread of, of, the, of this disease through the pandemic in various countries. Uh, this chart is actually done in D3, uh, but all the underlying data analysis and data management is done by John in R, which is uh, pretty awesome as well. So I just want to say thank you, um, in particular to the members of the our core team, past and present. Um, you can see all their names there, but we have them to thank uh, for all this amazing software uh, that we are using today. Uh, also mention once again that the slides and all the credits are available at this GitHub repository. Also like to thank you for watching. But in particular, I would like to just to interrupt uh, this conference for a moment. Um, I'll encourage my co uh, um, sort of team members in the uh, control booth to unmute uh, your microphones uh, so that we can all thank uh, Ben and the team and all the speakers uh, for everything that they've done to put together this amazing event today. So thank you to everybody. I really enjoyed it today. Thank you. Great job. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ben. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have one question about uh, any insights into the next 20 years for R? <laughs> that, I, I am not an oracle, uh, but I can make some guesses. And I probably point you back towards SAS. Uh, for those that don't know, SAS is still one of a very, very widely used data analysis software. It first came out in the 60s. Um, it's kind of considered to be the COBOL of data analysis today, but it is still in wide use. Um, and, you know, I would say that R has at least another 20 years in it just because of all the systems that already exist today um, that are reliant on R and people doing data analysis with R and systems that are built on top of R, and they'll keep on running for a long, long time to come. So there's uh, plenty of future there. 